My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Monday, October 1st, and I'm interviewing Kiowa bead artist Richard Aitson at his home in Claremore, Oklahoma. This interview is part of the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Richard, you've done beadwork of many different kinds, from cultural items to beaded stethoscopes, winning some of the top awards in beadwork at shows like Santa Fe Indian Market, the Heard Museum. Your work has been featured in a number of beading books, including one that came out this summer during Indian Market, um, Native American Art. And I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Sure. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Born in Anadarko on um, December 26, 1953. And it's questionable whether I ever grew up. <laughs> what did your mom and dad do for a living? Uh, mom worked um, uh, in, when I was in uh, elementary school. She was uh, the uh, house mother at Riverside uh, and progressed uh, all the way up to. Um, uh, uh, head of guidance um, at, at Fort Wingate School. At Fort Wingate, she was a guidance counselor. No, she was the head of guidance. Head of guidance Later on, um, uh, she changed careers several times. Uh, she was uh, the dean of students at uh, Bay Cone. And then when she retired from that, she decided she was going to teach Kiowa language in a different way, so she wrote her own textbook, um, and subsequently she um, uh, taught at Riverside, Anadarko, and um, uh, the uh, University of Science and Arts in Chickasha. Um, they have they will be releasing this um, in the next several months a 40-hour um, uh, series of uh, videos of her actually teaching one-on-one uh, -on -one with one of the students. So she'll be going through her, her whole book um, in, that, uh, uh, in that video. I'm not really impressed with that. Looking forward to it. Uh, Did you live in Muskogee for a while while she was... At Big Home? Yeah, I was the, uh, I was a beadwork instructor there. I'd taken over for uh, Grandma Spinks, and I guess everybody referred to her as <laughs> such, uh, who retired after teaching there for over 50 years, and she handpicked me to, uh, to succeed her. What about your grandparents on either side of your family? Uh, on my father's side, my father was um, Marlon Dates, and he was, um, uh, he lived in Gallup, New Mexico for many, many years and was associated with the, uh, uh, the intertribal Indian ceremonial. Um, and I think three at, for three years he was uh, the president and uh, several years he was the vice president, but he was always, on, he always seemed to be on the board. Um, his parents were uh, an interesting group. Uh, uh, my grandmother was uh, uh, the only daughter of uh, John and Florence Mamadetti. Her brother was uh, Al Mamadetti. And although, you know, we don't wear that on our sleeve, we don't hide from it either. Uh, uh, since then, I've developed a close relationship with Scott, Mama Day, and uh, his daughters. Um, Al Mama Day was my hero um, in many, many ways. Got to know him when I was uh, in high school. I was sort of his gopher when he taught a summer uh, a summer class at USAO, and. In that class, there were some pretty heavy-duty um, uh, 
painters, uh, Ernie Blue Jay uh, Keybone, Dennis Belindo, Robbie McMurtry, um, and I think Gene Bales. But uh, there was a, you know, a good strong core group of um, of artists uh, in there, and uh, his command of of the room was just overpowering. I love watching that man work. It, um, very similar to watching Dick West work. It's an overpowering voice, the big presence, command of uh, time and space, knew everything that he should know, and very likable. So those, uh, those kinds of teachers are few and far between, but when you have them, you embrace them. And uh, since I was his gopher, I uh, got a lot of free art instruction, but also a lot of wisdom. Um, my mother's parents, uh, well, let me get back to my father's parents. Uh, his father was um, a man named James Conad uh, from the, the White Buffalo family. Uh, uh, and he died when he was 23 or 24 years old. Uh, but prior to that, he was a legend in uh, early fancy dancing. After he died, my uh, grandmother married um, Richard Aitson, um, who was a, an aspiring professional baseball player. Uh, he was at Ottawa University, well, first at Haskell, then at uh, Ottawa, or was it, no, Shilako, and then uh, Ottawa. Uh, he was, he and his friend John Tippeconic were drafted by uh, St. Louis. Mm. Um, but they, since they were recent converts, uh, to Christianity through the uh, Rainy Mountain Church, they refused uh, uh, the contract because that meant they would have had to play play ball on Sundays, which uh, it's just something unheard of. But I admire so much their um, their faith and their uh, uh, their desire to do it correctly. Um, and when I think about that in, in regard to other well-known uh, Indian, or even non-Indian athletes, uh, that's some powerful stuff. Now my mother's family, um, uh, her grandfather was um, uh, a Kiowa Apache um, headsman named Tennyson Berry, who was uh, uh, a graduate of Carlisle. But uh, he also was a saxophonist and, and uh, the assistant conductor. And they played at uh, William Howard Taft's inauguration. He was also figure skater. What? Uh, the, the Carlisle uh, debated Harvard and Yale, and he was on the debate team. Um, he did just, <laughs> you know, a real uh, visionary and um, renaissance man. Uh, but I think he and I probably would have killed each other because I don't know if he really had that much respect for artists, <laughs> but, or artists with radical ideas and <laughs> notions. <laughs> but we may have been the best of friends, I don't know. Um, when I knew him, he was very, very old, very feeble, almost blind, almost completely deaf, um, and it was very hard to communicate with him, and, and yet you know that there was at some point in time, there was a lot of glory in this man. His wife was uh, Kiowa Annie, 
um, uh, who um, uh, um, uh, Union Pacific Railroad elected her the most beautiful Indian girl in the in the country, and her picture was in all of the um, uh, train stations west of the Mississippi. Uh, matter of fact, I just just purchased one uh, on eBay the other night. <laughs> oh, uh, she's a beautiful lady, but again, I knew her when she was very, very old and well into her nineties, um, and and certainly not um, not the uh, beauty that she that she was outwardly when she was much younger. Uh, my uh, my grandma was quiet lady. Her sister was Jeanette Mopope, who was somewhat more flamboyant than my grandma, but they knew the same things. They knew how to beadwork. They knew how to tan hides. They knew uh, kind of cultural issues perfectly. And my uh, grandmother in her early years chose to be a farm wife rather than a uh, powwow wife. Later on, um, uh, when my grandpa Dolphus Goombay began to get jobs as as a powwow announcer, uh, we we then started uh, going to a lot more powwows and. embracing camp life. Uh, so when we camped at the Indian Fair, we camped at the Indian Fair two weeks ahead. Uh, that was something to look forward to. At the same time, um, uh, while other kids were getting ready for school and that kind of thing, we were still living <laughs> Living in the tents at the at the fairgrounds, but you know that's that's what we did. So those were those some of your first memories also of seeing native art maybe at the fair. Uh, take it back even further. My grandma's my grandma's cousin was um, married to Jack Hokey. Uh, her sister was married to um, uh, Steve Mopo. And another cousin of hers was Lois Smokey, who I don't recall ever seeing her paint, but she um, she would put soles on moccasins for my grandma. And as time went on, when I began to actually study beadwork, uh, I found out how significant her contributions in beadwork were, as opposed to painting. There were, there were designs that she was doing before anyone, and I would always try and find multiple sources if someone made a certain claim about her or her sister Lucy Jackson. Like, um, for example, the, the sunburst uh, concept that everybody uses um, came about in uh, the 40s uh, with um, with Lucy Jackson when she and her then husband Clyde Atape had gone down to Mexico for a peyote meeting and they came back and she was copying uh, Serapi designs in beadwork. Consequently, um, you know, everybody in the world including Marcus Ammerman has used that as particularly um, uh, significant in um, among the Shoshones and Paiutes, probably as much as in Oklahoma, and I don't think that um, anybody has recognized that. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. But, you know, th there are small things that, you know, only, only, um, uh, beadwork geeks would, uh, <laughs> well, I've never used that before, <laughs> uh, beadwork geeks would, um, would appreciate in terms of uh, other contributions. That's the big one. That is the big one. And uh, um, 
I've heard that from a num probably six or seven different people have have confirmed that, and it was uh, people that were her peers. The original piece may even be in existence. I've been looking into that. It was a it was a belt she made for her nephew uh, Spencer Opitone when he was uh, ordained. So uh, he, she told me that was the first piece that she done in that uh, in that concept. So I would like to find that. Um, what was your first experience making art of any kind? Second grade, Fort Cobb. Miss Bird said, "All of you Indian <laughs> kids can draw." <laughs> So I figured if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna wear the mantle, I wear, we better wear it well. I wish she had said cook. Um, so secondary, throughout the grade levels, any involvement with visual art very strongly? Did you continue that? Or? Not particularly. Okay. <laughs> well, for part of high school, you attended Kimball Academy in Meridian, New Hampshire. How did you end up there? Got kicked out of Santa Fe for for taking over a building in Albuquerque. Oh, well, tell us about your institute <laughs> my, experience first. My, my <laughs> radical uh, politics. Your radical student days. <laughs> Oh, I'd rather not, but <laughs> needless to say, the, um, uh, the school gave me an option of uh, either leaving or, as the uh, agent told me, I have a list of all of your family that works for the, works for the <laughs> government, <laughs> and if you'd like to see them working tomorrow, uh, you'll uh, leave school. <laughs> Did you go to the institute during high school? Yeah. Okay. I was a I was a sophomore there, uh -huh. where I met um, Jan Chattelson, uh Sherman's sister, and through her um, uh, I got to know T C Cannon, uh, and later on when I was. Uh, I was a preppy. He was the um, artist in residence at uh, Dartmouth, and whenever he was giving a lecture, he always, always recognized uh, the former institute students. And it makes you feel so good when somebody that important is pointing you out when, when you sort of consider yourself to be insignificant. Well, at the Institute, were you interested in three-dimensional media? Were you interested in beadwork? Were you... No, actually, I went there as a music and creative writer. Okay. Uh, I found out how poor the um, music department was. And it's one of the reasons I choose, chose to leave anyway. I uh, wanted more academically than what they were offering. Uh, and then when I, I first left, um, well, I first went to Madison, Connecticut, uh, a program called A Better Chance. Um, and that's where I met uh, Donald Walsh uh, as my uh, poetry tutor. Um, and through him, um, got to know, through letters, uh, Pablo Neruda. Um, it was because he was translating. Yeah, he had translated the captain's verses um, in 1972 uh, for Neruda, and consequently um, Neruda won the Nobel Prize. Uh, it was also about that time that uh, I began to hear some rumblings from. Scott Mamaday and James Welch and other Indian writers so began to formulate things in that way, uh, writing a lot, getting things published, uh, 
without having to work at it very hard. Um, in some of the poetry journals or yeah, um, kinds of places. Also uh, won several major awards. Uh, this is really difficult to talk about because uh, traditional Congos don't talk about themselves. Uh, but I'm trying to do it as gracefully as I can. Um, so when uh, from Madison I went to Kimball Union Academy, uh, traveled um, traveled quite a bit um, uh, during those summers, uh, just getting a feel for what it was like to be outside of Oklahoma, outside of New Mexico, you know, just. Um, uh, expanding my my world, uh, the uh, and decided that I wanted to go to Stanford. Took an extra year of high school to get prepared. Got accepted. Went there and was really happy. And particularly when the uh, when the earthquake came. And my roommate's bed and mine were hitting together in the middle of the room, and I decided, well, since I'd already been accepted at Oberlin and the door was still open, <laughs> I would go to Oberlin, where I stayed uh, um, for the rest of my college career. Um, still lacking eight hours, but <laughs> and during that time, uh, I was. You know, one of the things I did was try and make uh, make a little extra money. Had watched my grandma bead work for years, picked up a lot, of, a lot of ideas and techniques, and made a little money. And uh, so, when um, my junior year, she was trying to get us all, all of uh, the dancers in my family, ready for dancing Carnegie. And I said, um, I need, I want to, I don't need a new pair of moccasins. I want a new pair of moccasins. And she said, you know how to do it. And here's the buckskin and here's uh, the rawhide. And you have your own beads, so go ahead and make them. And what surprised me is the first pair came out right. Wow. I uh, can't say so much about the second or third pair, but I learned how to correct my mistakes. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, Taft Hainta uh, came to me for some beat work. He was our our headsman, uh, Nelson Bigbow, um, a number of our headsmen, uh, and uh, began to come to me for for moccasins or other things and. I don't know how prepared I was to do that, but I also knew that I wasn't allowed to turn them down. So fortunately, I still had my grandma with me to coach me. And then when she passed away, I, I uh, relied on my, my aunt Gladys Ate Parton um, as my coach and mentor. Uh, unfortunately, her mother was still alive, and that was Lucy Blanche Jackson. So I could, um, I could go to both of them uh, for coaching when I needed. Uh, we uh, I learned so much about family history from that. Uh, I learned that my family from Verdon was related to the people at, uh, um, in Mears, and that's how come their beadwork looked alike. Um, and that uh, my great grandma, Barry, was also from that same family. So it's about that time I began to decide, I began to meet. Uh, beadwork and museum people who were 
who considered themselves to be experts, but I began to see flaws in their expertise, but they had the credentials. Can you give examples too? Maybe a quick example. Uh, okay, I'll give you one really good example. The, uh, the trailers on uh, the, the trailer fringes on the back of uh, Southern Plains moccasins. That for many, many years, those were regarded as, as hiding, uh, hiding one's uh, footprints. And it made no sense to me whatsoever because, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, these were not used during, um, uh, during the days when people were actually tracking people. So that, that made no sense at all. Second of all, they were meticulously done. These weren't your work moccasins. These were your absolute best. And generally, they were ceremonial pieces. And the third, if you're, if you're a 180 to a 200 pound Indian being tracked by another Indian, there ain't enough fringes on the back of a moccasin <laughs> who's gonna, that's going to hide anybody's tracks. So that made no sense whatsoever. So after finding out that that was a BS story, I let those guys continue with that because when um, th those were actually made for, or initially for horseback riding. And the reason, when they would come back from a raid, they would camp outside the um, um, the initial camp, the main camp, for um, for four days. And during that time, their families would bring them food and clean clothes, and fresh horses, and let them get get cleaned up, get rested, and then when they came back in, they would be riding the the best horses with the best buckskin suits. And when you're riding a horse, you want to look, and Kyle was particularly like those wonderful flamboyant rolled fringes uh, on their shirts and on their leggings. And since these fringes on the backs of their moccasins were extremely long, I mean, I'm talking maybe at least a foot long, obviously they weren't made for walking. <laughs> they were made for riding for showing off when you're riding a horse. So uh, I let, I let the, uh, the experts uh, continue that kind of nonsense. And then when I'm asked, um, I figure I can show them up if I have to. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard you share that with a few collectors, the, the true purpose of those. Um, so when you first started beading, what do you think um, sort of set your work apart? Attention to technique. Attention to detail. Making sure that um, moccasins are a funny thing. Either they are very elegant or they are really ugly and I couldn't, couldn't uh, see myself rushing through a pair of moccasins. They just looked ugly on someone. So I spent a lot of time uh, uh, making them look right. My early customers were Ray and Ethel McKee from McKee's Indian Store in Anadarko and Nellie Stevens at uh, Mohawk Lodge. And these folks were buying everything I made. Uh, also, later on, Snoopy's Indian store, uh, Marcy DePilla in Anadarko. Uh, and later, up into oh, the mid 90s, uh, uh, then I developed a uh, a relationship, friendship, uh, customer, dealer relationship with uh, Doris Litchville, Linda Griever, um, uh, 
but also during before that time, I uh, around 1980, I left Oberlin, and I picked up a really neat job in Aspen, Colorado. Uh, I started out as sales um, at the Squash Blossom Gallery, which was one of the finest Indian high-end Indian galleries in the country. Um, and I learned so much from from Earl Vance, who was very much a part of uh, the Gallup uh, trader legacy. Uh, he started out in guest ranches and then selling a little bit of silver and turquoise there to um, expanding his private business all the way to having five galleries and then developing places like Tubac, Arizona, West Gallup and uh, Aspen Highlands. And it was all from those beginnings of working in guest ranches and tourism. And what the tastes of uh, the clientele, or how to judge the taste of the clientele, and um, and work the market in that way. And I see galleries all the time uh, trying to force uh, the public to accepting their tastes rather than reading their tastes and offering that to them. So I learned a lot from from Earl Vance that way. Was this then about the time that you started shifting a bit into, you know, there's a, not necessarily making cultural items that are utilitarian, but thinking more in terms of other kinds of applications of beauty? Well, yeah, I got to know a couple of folks there. Nathan Youngblood uh, was. Uh, early influence even though he was my age but I saw that um, uh, somebody in their mid-twenties could already be considered a master uh, and maintaining high family standards um, with attention to detail so watching him like I said somebody my age uh, working in setting extremely high standards for themselves. Uh, I liked that. I liked it to the point that I put myself under those same restrictions. Because if I, if I had the audacity to say that, that um, my beadwork came from the same bloodline as Lois Smokey, then by golly, I'd better prove it, at least with quality. And were you selling some of your beadwork out of the squash blossom? Um, you know, I was so busy then that uh, there was very, very little time for that. Um, a number of times I was working seven days a week, and this is tourist industry. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when I had uh, the month of October off, I came back to um, to Oklahoma just to uh, recharge for uh, the, for the rest of uh, the winter season. Uh, spent Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, all of that in Aspen, uh, completely away from my family. And that was tough, but uh, all during that time, I was I was learning. What was the first? competitive show you entered with your beadwork? Maybe. 1969 Indian Fair in Darko. Okay. <laughs> How about another sort of show after you'd worked at Squash Blossom? And you... Well, the first that I set up at was um, it was probably Red Earth. Uh, I just really shied away from uh, doing shows. Uh, I liked to go and see my uh, my friends compete. I just didn't think I had the uh, 
the temperament for sitting in a booth and entertaining folks telling me about their their uh, Cherokee princess grandmother uh, and keep a straight face. <laughs> but uh, finally Bill Glass and several other people uh, talked me into uh, doing my birth. Since we were living in Oklahoma City then, um, it wasn't like I was going to be out of town much. I mean, I was staying too far out of town that I could always make it home. First year I got three third places. The next year I got a first and a best in category. My third year I got best in show. And at one point, maybe that was the award for your miniature cradle board? No, that was okay. uh, that was a gourd dance set. Mm -hmm. Moccasins, uh, gourd, fan, blanket, and blanket pin. Um, the cradles, wow, I, I think I've gotten... Uh, First place and best in category just about every time until very, very recently. And I can't believe that I blew out totally at uh, the Cherokee show with one of my cradles. <laughs> well, talk about, they're, they're just wonderful. Talk about how you first started getting into doing cradles. I owned one. I owned uh, the Sonic Colonel Cradle. Um, and she was... Uh, ancestor of um, Lois Smokey and my great-grandmother Annie Berry and um, it got passed down to me. Then it came a very serious time when a bunch of people in my family were losing their houses or in danger of losing their houses within a matter of days. And I decided I have something that will rescue everybody. And I really never looked back after that. Uh, I felt no remorse about selling it. I feel no remorse now. I did what I had to do. Um, when um, But I didn't let it go without taking a lot of A lot of um, notes in my head about what to do. So when 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 it came time to that, I felt like doing one. I made two um, uh, full size cradles before I tried the little ones, and I like the little ones because it takes me a week, maybe ten days, to do one from start to finish, and that includes. Um, Planing all, planing and sanding all the wood, um, all the design work, uh, everything from start to finish. Uh, aside from tanning hides, uh, I do. And when I get started, I don't like to work on anything else. So that's why it takes a week to ten days at the Straight most. Through. And I will. I've been known to pull all nighters. Once I'm once I'm in that zone, and I think I'll just look forward to that point when they're when time and space are irrelevant, and they uh, they are focusing on what will this look like in ten minutes, in two hours, or what will it look like in the morning when I'm close to being finished. You never want to feel like you're finished with it. Uh, but uh, even when it's finally, when you finally sign your name to it, you're looking at it like, I could have added something, I could have done this or that. But um, once you put your name on it, you really don't own it anymore. So um, that's like, uh, telling the world, okay, now it belongs to you, just just pay me what it's worth. That's your cutoff point when you sign it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you showed, of course, at Santa Fe Indian Market for a number of years. 
when did you start showing there and and what do you like about that show? I was about 10 years ago. Yeah, about 10 years ago. Oh, it's just the biggest and uh, um, where you run into all your folks and friends. And, uh, the first show of the year, of course, is The Herd. Uh, I like doing that because everybody bring everybody is so fresh after <laughs> being holed up uh, for the winter. The new ideas, the new beads, the new uh, uh, um, the new artists, um, and they are getting good. They are very, very good. Uh, particularly like uh, Deani Smith, Young Bird, and. And and um, Kenneth Williams Jr. Uh, pure bead workers and excellent, excellent. Just love their work. Of course, there's always Jamie Okuma, who, even though she's pro probably not even 30 yet, uh, is, is considered uh, one of uh, one of the older group because she's been competing with us for so long. <laughs> and a jillion of those growing thunders, and everyone else better than the next. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, generally as a rule, we are friendly with each other. Um, I don't see that happening with with all the artists, but the bead workers are generally really friendly with each other and willing to help and willing to give advice. Um, that's, well, I, I enjoy that part. And the bad part is, I'm considered the old man of the movement now. <laughs> yes, but they come to you for wisdom and advice. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but... Uh, How important are commissions for you? Commissions? Oh boy, they pay the bills. That is, yeah, they really do pay the bills, so. Um, I don't know if I would rather have commissions or do, or do a good regional show. Because the, the commissions are sure money. And sometimes you end up spending much more money doing a show than you bring in, so. I like, uh, I like that part of uh, you know, being assured that I'm going to get something. So I, um, I don't like to gamble, so I, I like the commissions. You've taught bead work for numerous years now. Mm -hmm. How do you approach your classes? Well, I figure that I'm going to have some that are, <laughs> are real rookies. And I'm going to have maybe 10% that are uh, experienced bead workers to some degree. And I work from that perspective first. Um, have to talk about regional styles. If somebody says they want to want to do uh, beadwork like their grandmother, and their grandmother was, um, uh, say, Lakota, then I have them look at pictures of Lakota beadwork and show them the technique that they or a number of techniques that they can use. If um, if they're just wanting to make a pair of moccasins nice, respectable pair of moccasins for themselves. I approach it from a different way, um, more from technique. Uh, this is the sole, this is, uh, these are the tops, this is how you cut it. This is how you form it to your foot. And uh, uh, encourage them to use uh, their own mind's eye for designs. Uh, now, 
Of course, like any other working artist, there are some things I keep for myself. When it comes to beading, do you think a distinction should be made between art and craft? It all depends on how high quality the craft is. Uh, if, if it's the same piece over and over and over again, um, then it becomes mindless and a tribal member it doesn't have to be done by a tribal member. Um, that's why I, I work so hard at teaching, teaching my students to look into their own past and then show them uh, the techniques that were associated with, with that culture. What beadwork creation are you most proud of and why? Did a pair of moccasins with long fringes instead of jingles. And I've seen several pairs with like this uh, in magazines with um, mezcals on the fringes. Well, I took that pair to uh, Los Angeles to uh, the Autry for, um, uh, for their show. I had what I considered better pieces. I had a buckskin shirt, I had a toy cradle, um, and yet these moccasins got best in show. My contention is you can never ever plan on best in show. You can push yourself to be to have best in category. But that's the best you can plan for and even then you're really at the mercy of judges and your competitors but you know what you have to do to get to that point. Uh, but uh, best in show, you can never ever plan on that because you can't, you shouldn't be able to sway judges. You shouldn't be able to sway uh, uh, anything when it gets to that level and let the judges have their fun. And you've been on that end in the judging process. You've oh, yeah. done judging too. What oh, challenges yeah. does that present? Well, it's, um, at some point you're judging apples against oranges. So you take, you take um, it's, I would imagine it's like judging the Westminster Dog Show. You don't judge the Great Dane versus the St. Bernard, and which one is the better dog? You look at this one and think, well, is this the best Great Dane there is in competition? And is how does it stack up against the best St. Bernard? But eventually it gets to what piece actually moves my heart. Uh, Several years back, I judged uh, Red Earth with um, Jean Quick to see Smith and Michael Horse. And since she was the elder of the three of us, we, Michael and I, designated her as our head judge. Now, ordinarily, that doesn't mean a whole lot, but it really came down to two pieces that were exceptional. Uh, Mitchell Boyadel had done a whole peyote set in in uh, size 16 beads and I'm um, just so impressed with the, the fact that it was all done in super tiny beads 
the the fan was a match set of red macaws. Um, all the beadwork was exactly matching. Even the bundle of sage was met, was beaded. On the other hand, I think Clarence Lee. I think that's who it was. Had a, a sterling silver pickup truck that, if you turn the wheel. You put your finger inside there and turn the wheel, the uh, tires turn. <laughs> there were even tiny little um, uh, uh, windshield wipers. This thing was beautiful. So what do you do? Do you go for the piece that is so, so traditional and or do you go for the piece that has taken silversmithing to a completely different level? So you do what a really smart judge does. You pass it off to your <laughs> your uh, head judge, who stood there and looked at both and looked at both. And you you're you're all this time you're learning from her. And she says, "Okay, you guys, um, we're going to do it this way, and I expect you guys to back me up on this." And she said, "The only reason I'm giving it to the POD set." is because you can actually take that and use it at a meeting tonight. The quality of these pieces are so high that this is the only standard that uh, we can apply. And so, you know, that, that builds uh, on what you've learned and now you have another reason to to add uh, when you're judging. So I try and learn things like that. Um, if I'm judging silver and turquoise, um, I try and see if uh, there's, they're staying with uh, Zuni standards or Navajo standards, uh, if the lapidary work is high quality, if they're doing innovative things, or if they're going so far out of the box that um, that they've left left uh, too much of their Indianness behind, and if people say that, well, you don't have the right to to make that determination. Well, as the judge, I can I can say anything I want because I'm the judge. That doesn't mean I'm always right, but. It seems like the right thing for me to say at the moment. Not, and, and I've had some some folks uh, really disagree with me violently, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, their time, if they're if the quality of their work uh, is is high enough, they'll be asked to be a judge. Mm -hmm. They'll be in their shoes. And then they can have all the revenge they want on me. <laughs> You've sort of explained, you know, the biz, sort of the business education that you got through Squash Blossom. I'm wondering what the most important thing about the business of art is that you've learned. Integrity, and by that I mean, I turned down pieces when buyers would come in um, because I knew that they were misrepresenting, uh, telling me that a certain person was was Indian when I knew that they weren't, and yet I could buy from that person uh, from the Indian. Uh, Even if an established artist comes in, his work is not up to to standard. And if they're trying to sell me a piece of junk, I have the option to say no. Uh, 
it just I think once you've worked on uh, on the back side of the counter you earn earn the right to say and do some things and particularly if you have been successful on that side so yeah Earl Vance taught me to be successful on that side to work with to earn him money and do it in a righteous way so um, when I worked for Linda it, it translated that way um, at the art market yeah. this is, mm -hmm. worked for her for about nine months uh, you know it's um, and then I buy and sell on, uh, on my own uh, on occasion uh, I'm fanatical about uh, garage sailing around here. And I found some good things. Uh, uh, found this kachina. Mm -hmm. It's double kachina for two dollars mm -hmm. in burden. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, about about all of these baskets, I've probably paid no more than uh, thirty dollars collectively mm. for all of these. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a whole stack of these uh, turkey baskets I bought for a buck and a half or seven of them. Uh, I found this uh, Seminole for I think a dollar and a half. Um, this little Mexican basket here um, I bought for 50 cents. Uh, this little Navajo basket and Quarter, another Seminole. Um, uh, my father-in-law found that for a dollar. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we just kind of went basket crazy up here <laughs> because that's what's available. Um, but I found, you know, wonderful things. Uh, found a Jack Hokey painting for fifty dollars. A Willard Stone for forty dollars. Oh my goodness! You've got quite a collection. Okay, um, so in 1990, when the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed, you know, requiring artists be certified, you know, by that tribe as artists of the tribe, or that they provide proof of enrollment, did you know how that, in, do you remember how that impacted artists and galleries? The galleries went into a panic because they had been handling work uh, of undocumented folks for all this time. Um, but then, you know, there are some some that uh, were hard to define, like like Willard Stone. Um, there were people who were outward, out, were being outlandish about their claims, um, like I've run across several people who were claiming Kiowa who were obviously not, could not give me a family history. The first thing that if one Kiowa meets another Kiowa outside of our territory, um, uh, the first thing you ask is, what family are you from? And if they can't tell you, then you become real suspicious. Oh. Oh. Um, oh. I've seen people claim one tribe at one show and another tribe at the next show. So um, uh, I know it's very difficult for a number of uh, gallery owners. Uh, so you, st you try and stay out of it because you have friends on both, on both sides, but at some point you really, in your own, for your own well-being, you got to draw a line in the sand and decide. You know, if their tribe, um, if their tribe accepts them, then you really don't have a whole lot to say about it. But you still want to see the documentation from their tribe. Uh, I know people were throwing fits at at major shows because they couldn't get in anymore. So be it. I'm 
it's not for me, us to determine, it's for the tribes to determine. And some people were getting, getting in with letters from tribal chairmen, uh, probably paying, um, paying political favors back. And we all know about that. I mean, we've, we've, we've been in this business a long time. Uh, and we know who the real ones are. But, you know, Indian politics is not the same as Indian art. And although they do intersect on a number of levels, uh, it's still up to the tribes to determine who's, who's the real thing. And for, you know, we've all heard, you know, well, my, my grandpa was too proud to, to have his name put on a roll. Great. That, that means you don't qualify. Or, uh, um, well, my family separated from the Trail of Tears. <laughs> and that was probably because they didn't want to be Indian. So you're paying the price for that. So, you know, I take a jaundiced look at a lot of those folks. Um, the only, the only, um, territory that I can actually get into are those who claim Kiowa and I've weeded out several who are not. Um, and I have no, no bad feelings about that at all. I'm going to go on to the next question, which is about your process and techniques. Um, what uh, you use primarily cut glass beads? I use cut beads. What else should uh, we know? Hides from Montana, rawhide from wherever I can get it. And I think I might maybe having to make my own rawhide at some point <laughs> yeah. very soon. If I can get one of the slaughterhouses to sell me uh, a hide, I'll be in the back scraping it. But, um, because the one hide maker that yeah the the hide maker the the raw hide maker died mm -hmm. and everybody was depending on him. Mm -hmm. um, do you use antique beads very much? Uh, when I'm doing restorations for museums and I and I keep a stash of those uh, back. Um, a friend of mine from Florida, Tom Halkus, um, oh about every couple of years sends me a sends me a stash of uh, antique beads that he picks up in Italy. And I will go to estate sales and such and buy up trashed out pieces just for the beads. Do you do very much restoration work? Not as much as I used to. Uh, it's more profitable right now for me to, to do my own work uh, and uh, I think I've pretty much rescued all the museums in the area. <laughs> what has changed about your beating process over the years? It's gotten much slower. Because uh, you're more exacting? As, or? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm much more critical of my own work. But uh, I also find it's not quite as daring as it used to be. Um, The um, the twenty four hour events marathons don't happen any longer. If they do, I'm usually a grump for for about two days afterwards. Uh, even when. Oh, even when I was much younger, a drive out to Santa Fe was uh, more um, a spur of the moment decision rather than planning months in advance now. <laughs> uh, because, you know, you can pack 20 college students into one room as opposed to uh, uh, your own family has to have. Uh, uh, certain necessities nowadays, like Starbucks and uh, 
That's right. Um, you know, I, as I remember, you use a lot of family designs, but I'm wondering if your, if your colors, your palette has changed very much over the years in terms of your beadwork. Yeah, because I'm taking more of an academic approach, uh, just because I have to. By academic, you mean? Uh, rather than uh, more concise with uh, colors that are opposing or complementary, as opposed to, man, that looks good. Maybe I'll just try that. <laughs> Sometimes it works and sometimes it's really, really ugly. <laughs> but it's worth a try. I don't experiment. I can't afford to experiment like, like I used to. And then taking designs and concepts that are very traditional and modifying them oh so slightly to fit what I'm doing. Uh, that seems to be more of what I'm doing nowadays. And primarily working with, of course, your technique depends, but peyote stitch when? Peyote stitch, overlay, lazy stitch, about six or seven different kinds of edging. Uh, uh, in my younger days, I would actually buy antique pieces, take them apart, just to see the technique. And I could kick myself for that now. Pardon me, but it did help out when mm -hmm. I did a restoration on um, on a walking stick that was that had been owned by uh, Geronimo. Now I know everybody in the world has heard that, but we had um, first the guy asked me to do an appraisal on it, and he had military photos from Fort Sill with uh, Geronimo actually using it as opposed to sitting there selling it. So that, that worked for me. Uh, that, that told me at one point he owned it. But to use uh, the, but to actually look at the piece, do the restoration on it, in the same technique, uh, all came from taking apart old pieces mm -hmm. and, and uh, knowing that, that technique well enough to do that restoration. You know, you've already referenced your rolled, rolled fringes a little bit, um, and you know, there's the fact that there's the beadwork in these pieces, but then there's also the, the work with the buckskin that's time intensive too, I imagine. Oh yeah. Um, is, is that a pretty time consuming endeavor? Well, I buy my hides from Montana for a couple of reasons. Uh, yes, I can tan hides. I don't like to tan hides. It's not uh, it's not something my uh, nice little old white neighbors would <laughs> like me doing in the backyard because <laughs> it smells bad, and we certainly don't want raccoons and skunks and other <laughs> vermin showing up um, in the middle of the night because we have enough of that here. Um, But uh, I buy my hides the same way my grandma did, uh, by quality, and I don't care who it's made by. But uh, I do have a source in Montana that does absolutely wonderful hides. Mm -hmm. um, what is your creative process from the time that you get an idea for trying a new piece? Draw it out, see what it feels like. Um, uh, what, uh, say if it's, um, say if I'm working on a purse, uh, how that purse will be held, if it's a shoulder strap purse, if it's something that needs to be held in the hand, uh, what kind of impact will the major design have, and then does, will it complement the other work or does it need to be a standalone piece? Uh, all 
those things go into, you know, this is what I will do with this. So it's, um, once I get that to that point, take out the sketchbook, get a rough idea of what I'm doing, do the initial big piece first, say if it's a medallion, do that first and then do the complimentary um, uh, lazy stitch around that and then hopefully by then it's something that I can actually uh, do, put fringes on and, and like. You've talked a little bit about two different approaches to research, one of which has to do with, like you said, taking things apart, see how they're put together, and then also scholarly kinds of research. Shh. Do you still do both as much as... Don't find as many um, pieces that I need to tear apart. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I think I've probably learned all I'm going to learn on that. Uh, but uh, I will look at classic old pieces for a long time, try and see what, um, trying to get into the, uh, the beat worker's head. What were they thinking? Why were they doing things in this way? And if I, were they, were they, uh, doing this for a ceremonial purpose, or utilitarian, or both? Uh, were they doing it as, as a piece for, say, uh, a family member, or were they showing off? And you can tell a whole lot about, um, about those, those things by keeping those things in mind. Were they showing off? I can tell you exactly that the women in my family went to the extreme to show off their talent. And for my competition pieces, you know, that's, that's what they left me. Uh, the desire to show off because as traditional Kylas, we don't speak about ourselves. This is, you know, we don't, I've heard two Kiowa women say that they were the best bead workers in Oklahoma. And by, they, they already violated rule number one. You never ever refer to yourself as the best if you're a real Kiowa. So, um, that that puts their traditionalist uh, uh, moniker in another place uh, for me, and I can make that I can make that judgment now. I've earned the right to make that judgment now. I've been doing this for well over forty years. But you can show that you're the best. That is the, that's the idea. You don't have to say it if you're proving it. Let somebody else say it. Let the judges say it. Let, let the person who buys it say it. Let, but you're just not allowed to say it. And to do that is really insulting to, to the way that traditional values were taught. What's your creative routine, or do you have a routine for something? Uh, it's pretty mundane. <laughs> uh, uh, there's nothing special about that. Uh, do you work every day? Every day. In some way. Mm. If I'm not... Uh, if I'm not actually in the beads, I'm designing, I'm absorbing something, I'm reading an article. Um, 
on the computer looking at uh, older pieces or even newer pieces. That's been a great tool. Yeah. Uh, and seeing what these what these kids are doing and how I'm gonna have to compete against them. And I still contend that oh my game may not be what it was 20 years ago, but oh I don't hit foul balls every time. <laughs> In terms of beadwork, I think it's kind of common, by common agreement, it's just been one of the art forms that just has never, you know, brought in the money it deserved. What do you think the situation is now? Is it quite a if bit you, better? If you want it that bad, you'll find it. You'll make it. Um, there are a couple of truths that will always exist. Indians need moccasins. Indians will spend money on moccasins. So, moccasins have been my mainstay. Uh, they can always find a medallion for their blanket or something like that, but they have to have moccasins that fit them well. Um, and I'm sure that is the case with the sun dancers, that they you know, that's the rules. You don't come in there with street shoes or sneakers. Uh, it's a case with uh, black leggings and gourd clan that you you really don't need to show up if you are not wearing moccasins. So I and the, you know these uh, Osage folks um, around here uh, buy uh, buy my moccasins. They pay me well still make allowances because they're Oklahoma Indians and most of the people I sell to are friends anyway um, but uh, you know um, if you want to work that hard you can earn earn well mm -hmm. but but you got to keep your quality up looking back on your career so far what's been one of the high points I mean, the Kiowa Museum um, designate me as a master. That's wonderful. When, when was that? 25 years ago. Now, there are two of us left out of the initial group. Mm -hmm. And one is uh, Vanessa. I would like to see it expanded again uh, to include some people like Terry Greaves. Um, uh, because she's earned uh, accolades enough to be considered a master. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think it also goes in terms of uh, what you know in terms of all of the techniques, uh, not just what you've won. But she's, you know, she's proven that, and uh, I would feel very comfortable referring to her as master. What has been one of the low points of your career so far? It hasn't happened yet, and I, the reason I say that is that I'm mature enough to find. something usable in terms of my career every day. Now, personal personal life, not even getting into that. That's something outside the realm of this interview, but uh, professionally, um, as long as my hands and eyes and back are functioning, I'm going to be beadworking, and that will sustain me. Um, if, if there's an event that is so 
so memorably destructive that it it becomes a low point or the low point then my angel of beadwork has been defeated and I'm not going to allow that to happen I got too many grandmas that uh, <laughs> that would be very disappointed if I reach to that level and it's not going to happen. Is there anything else you'd like to add or talk about before we look at your deed work? Um, nope. All right, so we're looking at some examples of your work. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about each one? Well, okay. Um, coming up with a concept of um, uh, blackjack oak leaf mm. and trying to modify that into into something that's workable for a dress. Wow. Um, so I've come up with this. That's um, really nice. And I'm sure I'm not through with it yet. Uh, this other, this will be uh, the uh, the medallion for a uh, very fancy bolo tie. I've gotten a new, new kind of strap that um, runs about a hundred bucks a piece. Oh. Uh, this one will probably be a blanket pin and uh, a pair of moccasins that should be finished in a couple of days. I'm modifying those and changing them. Um, uh, but if you can see that there's. Uh, a whole lot more work than the usual um, Southern Plains kind of moccasin. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's the kind of thing I'm up to nowadays. Gorgeous. But even with uh, the uh, the Buffalo rawhide soles. Uh, oh man. Uh, these are going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Let's just straighten them out for one quick second to look at that view. Ah, uh, well. It's gorgeous. I wish I had more, but it goes out as soon as I'm finished with it. Right. Because <laughs> i got to feed all of these puppies. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today, Richard. Absolutely.